Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, Coffee with David Meeker, and I'm Travis Bailey at First Bank. Um, my company is honored to uh, be the presenting sponsor for the Coffee with Leader series, and we just believe it's a great opportunity to hear firsthand experiences of our top business leaders in the community. And so just a little bit about uh, First Bank. So First Bank is the largest community bank uh, headquartered in North and South Carolina. We're actually uh, home base is Southern Pines, North Carolina. And um, I have actually been with First Bank for over 14 years. And, um, you know, one of the strongest points for me is that First Bank is, is, is small enough that we can, we can attend to the local business community, but we're large enough to be able to handle uh, metro markets such as Raleigh. Um, we we dabble a lot in uh, CRE, commercial real estate development. Um, we have a, a very strong private banking division um, that we've just established here in the Triangle, um, as well as uh, our, our personal and retail divisions. And so we have a, a strong team in place. We have branches located in Raleigh, Cary, uh, Fuquay, and Apex. Uh, which is our Wake County, Wake County market. We have over 100 branches scattered across the state. And, um, you know, it's, uh, we're all kind of dealing with a, uh, with a difficult time right now, but, you know, we're very proud of our, our bank and very proud of our employees and our teammates for what we're doing for the community right now. Um, so uh, today, though, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, uh, Raleigh native David Meeker, who helped found Trophy Brewery and a, a carpenter development uh, back in 2008. Um, David, like like all of us in business, has made a lot of mistakes, um, but created a lot of experience that he's you know open to share with our community. And so David's on the board of Common Calls, uh, North Carolina North Carolinians for Redistricting Reform, Raleigh Chamber, Downtown Alliance, Dix Park, Art Space. Um, he's actively involved in fundraising for healing transitions, um, a detox or recovery center on Dix Park. Uh, David lives in downtown Raleigh with his wife and two boys, uh, ages one and three. So um, David is uh, staying pretty busy, I'm sure, with that. And Trophy Brewery was uh, looking forward to a great 2020, just finishing their state of beer expansion. Um, and weeks away from their Trophy Brewery on Morgan Street expansion. Um, you know, opening when the coronavirus hit. Uh, Morgan Street obviously is 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 one of our one of our most prideful uh, restaurant spots and in uh, local local hangouts in Raleigh. And so, and I know David was extremely excited about that. And you know, in, in dealing with the virus. And so, over the course of a few days, David hit the ground hard, having to furlough most of Trophy Brewery's employees and just trying to you know figure out how to survive through this. Like like many of us in business, you know, we we deal with uncertainties all the time, but this has been just a uh, something that has been very difficult because we don't we don't really have anything to compare it to. So we'd like to listen to how David is dealing with the pressure and stress of it all and how his business has shifted. Um, he's been able to keep a few managers on payroll and how Trophy Brewery is planning to function in this in this new age. Um, so please take. Take a few minutes to uh, type any questions in the chat box, and we'll we'll open up for question and answers at the end. And uh, so let's welcome David. Good morning. Thanks, Travis. Really, really appreciate the intro, and thanks to Dad, yes, Des. Yes. And thanks to Des and the Raleigh Chamber for putting this on. For those of you all who don't know Des, um, she's a true team player, and it really showed in this quarantine. She uh, voluntarily moved in with her sister and her sister's five kids at the beginning of the quarantine uh, with her sister still going to work. Um, so she uh, she's really winning sister of the, the year award um, for, her, for being a team player during this. Um, for those of y'all who don't know me, I guess you've heard Travis's intro. I'm a partner in Trophy Brewing and Carpenter Development. Trophy Brewing is a production brewery um, and Carpenter Development's a real estate investment company um, with commercial tenants. I wanted to start today off with a Broughton and Inlow story. Um, for those of y'all who aren't from Broughton and Inlow, uh, or aren't from Raleigh, Broughton and Inlow are um, downtown high schools that have academic and athletic rivalries. And the story is sort of timely 
with this week. Um, so I went to MLO, graduated in 2002, and then went away to college. But when I was coming back, um, there was a campaign by Broughton students uh, to turn the front lawn area there into parking. And, uh, and there was a counter campaign against that, sort of saying, hey, this is the um, picturesque spot of Broughton, this nice grass in front of this historic building. We shouldn't do that. And the students who wanted the parking um, so that they could get to school faster or more conveniently um, put on a protest. And, um, and one of the protesters had a sign that said, you know, class before grass. You know, if, if we, uh, we need the parking so we can get the class uh, on time, that's more important than, uh, than, you know, having a grass lawn. And I thought, man, that is really interesting. At Inlo, we always said grass before class. <laughs> um, okay, wanted to start off with something funny. Um, you know, currently, our current situation um, um, for a lot of us is, is not funny at all. There's some of you on the call who's experienced, whose businesses have experienced a 10 or 20 percent hit. Um, and then there's some of y'all in my shoes where things have been completely flipped upside down. And the reason the chamber asked me to come talk today was they wanted to talk to somebody who was flying high before this. Um, who hit the ground hard, you know, with the coronavirus um, and is trying to navigate this new world and pivot and, and find some silver linings. And I want to talk about all that today. Um, and I have a few themes I want to hit. Um, and the first one is things are never as bad or as good as they seem. Things are never as bad or as good as they seem. So we'll go back to my businesses before this. Let's just take March 1st. We were, we thought we were flying high. We had just finished at Trophy Brewing. We had just finished our state of beer expansion. Um, we had actually had our opening party and we were looking forward to new sales there. At Trophy Brewing on Morgan Street, we were about 95% of the way um, on that renovation. Um, and we were gonna open just in time for spring weather. And we were looking forward to sales there. Um, of course, um, and so we sort of thought, hey, we're on cloud nine. 2020 is going to be our best year ever. We're going to get out of the weeds. We're going to save some money. Um, you know, we're actually going to be in a good place. Well, things weren't as good as we thought they were. We were just finishing those renovations. So we had, actually hadn't seen any sales there. Uh, we hadn't been able to build back up our bank accounts. And at Trophy on Morgan Street, we hadn't finished the construction project. So we hadn't finished and our bills there. Um, so we were sort of, you know, feeling, um, you know, higher than we should have been. And, and looking back on it, that's clear. So then over the course of a week in mid-March, everything fell apart for us, just like it did for a lot of people on this call. You know, our businesses went from being packed to closed. We were worried about our employees getting the coronavirus. We were worried about our customers getting the coronavirus, we were worried about being a place where it spreads. Um, and, um, and pretty quickly, we had to do the calculation of how, um, you know, how long could we pay our team and stay in without any revenue, a calculation we have never done. We had never done the no revenue calculation. We'd done the 20% drop calculation. Well, the picture was way uglier than we could have expected, and we would have only made it a few weeks paying our team with no revenue. So we had to make hard cuts that would allow us to get reopened when this ends, because uh, we're gonna everyone's gonna have to restock and and have you know be able to you know hire folks when this comes to an end. And so, how do you best prepare for that? And those conversations are hard. And, you know, we had to let a lot of people go or furlough a lot of people. And a lot of those people have been long-term employees who are best friends. So if you're going through that, you know, I can certainly empathize with you. Um, and there should be some comfort knowing that we're all going through the same thing together at the same time. Um, for those of us that have been in hard situations before, it's normally because we've made a bad decision. Well, in this case, it's, you know, out of our control. Um, so, so then the question is, how does the business survive? 
and um, in in you know the situation, uh, we had no proven to go business. We had no proven grocery store business um, that we could really fall back on. At least nothing that we were comfortable with. So things are really up in the air. Um, on the development side, I do want to hit that again. March first, and our on our development company, we had eight projects that are finished with eight tenants. Um, all eight of our tenants were paying rent and we thought were very secure and not a lot to worry about. At the end of March, all eight of our tenants had been significantly impacted by the coronavirus. We have three other restaurant tenants. Of course, they were closed or only doing takeout. And then um, we had service tenants. We have a composting tenant, for example, that deals a lot with the universities. We had a food truck maintenance um, tenant who, of course, food trucks are out of business. We had a church that caters to our most vulnerable who lost their donations and are more needed than ever. So my two companies, Trophy Brewing and Carpenter Development, really had no sort of path forward and, um, and the cash train was going to you know, put us out of business. It felt like it was going to put us out of business really quickly. So again, coming back to that Point, things are never as good or as bad as they seem. Things weren't as bad as they seemed in that first week. Um, they, we did pivot to, to go. Although you can't make money on to go because the margins are so thin, you can slow your cash drain and you can keep some key people on staff, at least with a pizza restaurant. We've been able to do that. Um, we also have ramped up our beer in grocery stores. Um, where you know we didn't do a lot of sales there before um, and created new relationships there. And then with the um, development company, we when we were figuring out how long we could make it with no tenants paying rent, we didn't factor in that banks would be willing to defer the mortgage. Well, a week and a half, two weeks into this, um, banks sort of started to say, hey, this is different than anything we've dealt with in the past. And we will, in some cases, be willing to defer the mortgage, at least in our case, um, they have been. And so that gives us a lot more runway to wait this thing out. If our tenants aren't paying rent, but the mortgage isn't due, we can, we can last a lot longer. So, um, so things weren't as bad as they really seemed. So then you start to think about the pivot. Where do we go from here? And our sort of theme here has been make short-term decisions, but keeping the long-term in mind. So make short-term decisions, but keeping the long-term in mind. So at Trophy, when you think about pivoting to the to-go business and grocery store business, those are two revenue centers that we could um, potentially keep going long-term after the coronavirus is done. The margins are thinner than selling a beer to someone on site, but the uh, but the, you know there is income there, and if you scale properly, it could be helpful long term. And so, um, so we sort of looked at that as a positive, and there was more reason to get good at it if we were going to do it for several years rather than just a couple of months. The second thing we did there was we kept our managers on the payroll. And people, some people ask, why would you keep your managers on the most expensive people? Um, when you are running out of money. And the reason we did that was so that, again, keeping the long term in mind, so that we could get reopened quickly after this is done, start to generate some revenue again. Um, and, um, and so if we have our managers in place, things start to open up, they will be able to rehire their team quickly. Um, rather than having to find a new manager and get started, which could, which could take weeks or months. Um, and then the last thing at Trophy we did was we decided to finish up our Trophy on Morgan Street expansion. It's actually a tough decision because, um, you know, we were about 90, 95% of the way there. Some businesses stopped all construction and saved cash. Um, you know, there's a, some logic there. We decided to go ahead and finish that project um, and be and have it sit finished and ready to open when this thing ends, rather than being 95% of the way there, having to re gear back up um, and, and finish after this ends. So that when things start to open up, we will have that space ready. So again, 
made a short term decision thinking the or thinking about the long term. And then on the development front, you know, um, we decided to um, waive the rent for all eight tenants. Again, all of our tenants were impacted um, seriously by the coronavirus. Um, we wanted to make the best long term financial decision for us and our tenants and the best financial thing that could happen is all of our tenants uh, reopen when this is done and pay rent again. Um, some of them wouldn't have been able to pay rent anyway, so it wasn't really a question, but even the ones who could have paid rent, if we can waive it because we're getting our mortgage waived, um, then they'll be in a much stronger financial position coming back, which is what our company needs long-term. We want them to stay around. And then also, um, you know, at that time I was having some trouble sleeping, worried, being worried about my business and waiving the rent for my, for my tenants definitely felt good and helped me, helped me sleep some. And then the next theme is um, sort of bad times aren't all bad. I'll say that again, bad times aren't all bad. There are probably things in your company that you've been doing that don't make money or you don't enjoy doing, um, and they, they were hard to get out of uh, when times were good. But when bad times come, they allow you to make structural changes um, to your business to get out of things that you wanted to get out of but couldn't before. Um, you can blame the, um, you know, getting out of them on the coronavirus. Nobody's gonna question you, it's a great excuse. And, and you can always look back at this time um, as, oh, wow, you know, that was a really hard time, but we were able to get out of this or pivot to this instead. And, and that was a nice silver lining. At Trophy, you know, we're, we're taking that opportunity too. We had one location that took a lot of work and was only making a little bit of money. We're going to pivot that concept and to something I think is going to be very successful long-term. And we may look back at the coronavirus allowing that pivot and it was really a game changer in a positive way for our business. Um, so, um, so, you know, use this time as an opportunity. The second thing in terms of bad times aren't all bad is a big thing the chamber's been pushing. It's a great opportunity to reaffirm your company values. Why did you get into business in the first place? A lot of folks did it because they worked for somebody else, thought they could do it, just as well or better and, um, and went into business on the rent. And what were you thinking when you did that? Did you wanna be a green company? Did you wanna help the most vulnerable people in your company? Um, you know, and, and how can you reaffirm that now, even in these hard times um, and do more of the things you wanted to do when you first started? At Trophy, we've already decided as a team to raise the minimum wage within our company when we come out of this. Our company minimum wage currently is $11 an hour and, and our dish, dishwashers sort of made that and then you go up from there. Well, um, now we've realized through this, or I think we knew it, but we re-realized that our dishwashers are our most essential people now. You gotta have plain dishes when things reopen. Um, and so we're gonna raise the floor um, to 12 or $13. Of course, that raises everybody else up and how are we gonna do that financially? Well, we don't know because we don't know what our sales are gonna be, but we're gonna figure it out. And um, if nothing else, we'll feel better about our company um, long-term because, um, because we're getting back to our core values. And then the last thing with bad times aren't all bad is, I don't know about y'all, but I've been spending a lot more time um, at home, working from home, uh, my wife and I are trading off on the kid duties. Um, so I've spent more time with my two sons than I really did before ever. Um, I was sort of one of those business people who leaves home at 7.30 and gets home at 6.15 or 6.30. And that was just normal. And you normally had an event once or twice a week and um, just wasn't home as much um, as, you know, maybe I should have been. And this time with them has really made me realize what's important. Um, we've done some distancing beers with neighbors um, in, our, in our yard. And uh, apparently that's 
normal thing that happens in the neighborhood in normal times, but I've never been there for it. Um, and, and there are things, there have to be silver linings that sort of you're realizing um, can come out of this. Um, you know, life changes that when we look back on the coronavirus period, we can say, hey, you know, we made that shift in our personal life or with our business. And, um, and that was a really positive change long term. One example is these Zoom calls. They just seem so much more efficient um, to me than in-person meetings. And I think those will continue long term. And then my last sort of theme it, that I want to mention is um, something you all have heard before, but it's always a good reminder, reminder is optimistic and persistent people run the world. I'll say that again. Optimistic and pers persistent people run the world. If you stay positive through this, if you can um, continue to pivot your business, try new things, eventually something will work. If you can back that up with hard work over time, your business will come out of this. It may look different than it did March 1st, but your business will come out of this and you'll there'll be a lane for you in whatever the economy looks like then. And, um, and I want to take that to the sort of trophy brewing business. So we are currently at, you know, the, at the, on the floor, you know, we're just trying to survive and come back or be ready to come back. But when things open up, they're not going to open up a hundred percent. You know, we're not going to have a hundred percent capacity. You know, we may be at 20% for a month. Well, if you can get excited and figure out how to make 20% capacity be good for your business, or maybe it's continue to go, or you find a new lane um, to create some revenue, then you will um, be in a much better mental state to run your business than if you are depressed about the 20% or down about it. It's okay to have down moments, and you know I've even been paralyzed at times from, from how bad things got so quickly. But um, if you can stay positive with you with mentally and, and with your team, then you will, then your business will come out of this in a better place. So again, optimistic and persistent people will run the, run the world. Okay, that, that sort of closes my remarks and I'm gonna kick it back to Des for the Q&A session. All righty, thank you so much, um, David, for sharing with us. We have several questions. I wanna begin with just a question that I think is interesting. If you had to pick one beer that Trophy brews as you go during, as, as you go through um, quarantine, what would it be? Okay, well, that's easy for me. And I wanna pick one Trophy beer and then I wanna pick um, two other local beers. So the Trophy beer I drink, um, at, you know, on Friday afternoon, which I think is like the best moment of the week to have a beer is Cloud Surfer. It's our modern IPA, a little hazy, and it's great after a three or four mile jog on Friday afternoon. Um, but then I also, also want to mention two of our friends um, that we, that Trophy came up with, which are Bavana and Crank Arm, two other downtown breweries who are in a bad spot during this pandemic too and trying to survive. And um, Bavana did a great service beer, a pale ale that where the profits went to service workers. And Cr uh, Crank Arm has a great hazy IPA now too. So right now I'm drinking all three of those beers um, to help me get through this pandemic. All righty. Another question that I have um, that came in is, how successful or unsuccessful have small businesses been with PPP any local banks that have been better than others that you know of? Um, so, you know, good question. I think the answer to that varies. Some small businesses have gotten the PPP um, and some haven't. And it's unfortunately sort of become an equity issue. If you have access to um, a good bank or you have a good lending relationship or a good accounting firm, you've been able to get help. And some of the smallest business businesses who don't have that access haven't been able to get help yet. Um, in our case, we have gotten approved for PPP. Um, we do a lot of banking um, with other banks, but the bank we ended up going with was Dogwood Bank. Um, and that's because of our a relationship our accounting firm had with them. 
Um, and so we sort of shipped, you know, pretty quickly to them. Um, the PPP was expanded, I think, yesterday. So if you are a small business and you didn't get um, money the first round or didn't get your application in, now is really the time to to get in and do that. And um, and maybe we can maybe the chamber can sort of put a list together of small banks that are are, are helping new customers out get that money um, because it is a good fund. And then for us at Trophy, it gives us an eight week um, long you know you know an eight week expansion of how long we can make it um, on with our cash flows, which is really helpful because. Um, you know, I do think things will start to open up at some some point in eight weeks is a is hopefully a good portion of that. Great. Thank you so much for that. We have a question from Jason Hibbets. Can you talk more about your company values and how you reinforce them with your employees during this time? Yeah, so you know, our company values have um have been really you know related to trying to help our most vulnerable people and, and trying to be an environmentally conscious company um a couple of things that we're doing is how can we give back to our employees and our um in you know in the community now so one thing is people are tipping at um at our locations on the to-go food so our managers decided instead of taking those tips because they're getting their full salaries, they would give those tips to their employees who are out of work. And so we've, um, in some cases, just given the cash to our employees who are out of work. Um, in other cases, we bought groceries. Um, last week, we bought you know a bunch of gift cards, or $75 gift card for every employee out of work to Weaver Street Grocery, trying to support local businesses. Um, so, and, and then we're using our locations for other folks um, to give food to. So Cisco is doing a big um, food drive or um, food giveaway for service workers out of work. Our Trophy Brewing location is used for that. Um, and, um, and so we're trying to be as helpful to good causes as we can. Another one is our uh, the North Carolina Healthcare Worker Foundation is um, providing a bunch of sandwiches to healthcare workers. And so our state of beer location is involved with that. And then the second thing is sort of um, a piece that you know I mentioned is coming out of this because we're going to be all in all in a bad financial spot for some amount of time. Don't give up on your values. Like if you um, if helping your most vulnerable people is what is important to you, raise the minimum wage for your company out of this. Um, if helping save the planet is important to you. Well, don't give up on the solar panels that you were going to install on on your roof. Even at our location at Trophy Brewing on Morgan Street, it would be easy for us to second guess spending money on installing solar panels on that location now. But it's honestly one of the only things that helps me sleep right now is, hey, we did when things were good, we did the right thing. And um, and I just I think other companies will feel that too. If you if you do the right thing now, it'll help you mentally get through this and then we'll all come out in a better, better place. Great. Thank you so much for that. I have a question from Mary Jo Gellenbeck. Social distancing has impacted our conscious behavior and may get embedded into our subconsciousness. Have you approached the Raleigh City Council to redistribute sidewalk space to small business owners for customer distancing needs, more dining space, customer waiting area, et cetera. By, redi right, by redistributing road space for vulnerable road users, pedestrians, joggers, light individual transport to access travel. So the short answer is no, I haven't approached the city council on that, but I love the idea that she's talking about. And one is just the reality is people are gonna distance for some amount of time. Um, you know, maybe a year or two, and um, all businesses need to be prepared for that and how they're going to operate in this new world. If it doesn't end up being that um, being that long, well, you're over prepared, and that's a good thing. But in the restaurant business, we need to be prepared to space our tables, and we need to um, be prepared to to you know make our businesses work with that. So what she's mentioning is, you know. Um, restaurants, for example, using sidewalk space because we don't have as much space 
inside anymore. Um, or um, because people aren't driving to work, can bikers and runners sort of um, take over the roadways? And I do hope that, um, you know, moving to a greener economy is one thing that comes out of this. Um, you, you know, I've seen on person in Blunt Streets downtown, bikers and joggers sort of taking over the road. Um, and that would be a wonderful silver lining of this is if one of the infrastructure projects that comes from this is protected bike lanes or, um, or a greenway expansion project or using our existing roads for, to put a greenway on, you know, all of them so that people can bike or, or run. Um, so um, I like the train of thought that she's on. I've sort of, we haven't done anything on that yet because we've been in survival mode. And frankly, I think the city council is um, in survival mode. I'm, I don't envy the budget position there in either, um, but, but I do hope that, um, but that point, comes out of this that we have a new green economy. And one last point on that is, is parks. Um, you know, one place we have been able to go is greenways and sort of some trails and get out for a walk. And I hope that we, um, that parks are funded um, and parks and greenways are funded better than ever um, after this. And, you know, projects like uh, Dix Park and, and Chavis and, um, you know, or do continue to move forward so that if we are distancing long-term, folks have a place to go and get outside. Thank you for that. We have another question from Beth Berg. What would, you, what would be your advice for people wanting to open a small business in the future, knowing what we know now? Would you do it all over again and what will you do differently? Um, so, great question. Would I do it again? Yes, I would. Um, you know, in this moment, it's hard to to say that because if I were working at a bigger bigger company, maybe I wouldn't be worried about how I'm going to pay my bills like I am now. Um, but the when things were good, owning a small business was a really fun thing to do. Not because of the hours you work, because they're hard, um, and not because of the stress, because I think it's more than a normal nine to five job but because of the impact you can have on your community, people understand how hard it is to run a small business. And because of that, it gives you a voice. Um, and we've been involved with, because of the Trophy Brewing connection, we've been able to be involved with a lot of campaigns that we wouldn't have been involved with otherwise and nonprofits. And it really has been a fun thing um, to do. You know, how would I do it differently? You know, my problem has always been expand um, too quickly. And because of that, I've gotten myself in financial trouble twice before this. One in 08, um, in where we were getting involved with real estate deals right before the market went down. And then one in 2015, where we expanded too quickly. Um, that said, like both, circum both of those times, I was able to hunker down and grind through it. And I learned a lot from those times. Um, and this is different because um, it wasn't a bad decision we made. Um, and we're sort of, and honestly, there's something nice about that because we're all collectively solving this together rather than being alone and solving it together, which is how it was before. Um, but I think I would expand um, slower and more cautiously. Um, for example, now we're finishing two projects, State of Beer and Trophy on Morgan Street, um, and this happened. Um, maybe it would have been smarter to be doing one of those rather than both of them at the same time. So I think I'd be a little more cautious, and if I did that, I probably would have slept more at night and have a few less gray hairs. So, uh, But I, I, I do think small businesses will come out of this um, okay, and, and it, it'll be a great opportunity to launch new ones. There'll be a new economy, there'll be new revenue centers that we didn't have before, and there'll be, there'll be a place for the budding entrepreneur. Thank you for that. David, um, Natalie Heath asked a question. Can you talk about the idea of this flatten the curve virtual 5K and kind of how it goes about and how it really supports um, local um, brewery employees? 
So that's um, done by uh, a guy, Michael Forrester, who's in Rocky Mount, and a lot of breweries have supported his races that raise money for other nonprofits. So he wanted to um, to do a race that supported local brewery staff. And so you can sign up um, and you pay the normal entry fee and that money, and then you run a 5K and, and, and that money will then go to, um, to the brewery employees who are out of work. And part of the money comes from who signs up for your team and then the rest of it's sort of divvied up. But big picture, it's uh, a, ra a way to uh, put cash in the hands of our service industry workers who don't have a job right now and some who haven't been able to apply for unemployment for various reasons so or haven't been able to get unemployment so it's michael forrester out of rocky mount doing a really nice campaign to help people and it's ended up being a significant amount of money for our employees so it's been a great campaign so far awesome um Crash Greg had a question um, and he wanted to know what made you want to purchase the iconic Irregardless Cafe and how different is the management of this restaurant versus Trophy? And any do you foresee any changes coming soon in the near future? Yeah, so let me tell the Irregardless story because it's a great pandemic story. Is we bought that in on January 1st. Um, I bought the real estate in Lee Robinson and the the business there and we paid a a good price because it was we thought it was worth it and um but we were nervous about the price we paid because um we wanted to see how things um we wanted to see if sales continued the same as they did before under previous ownership well in mid-february both lee and i were feeling wonderful about the deal things were going great and uh and we were literally like wow you know business is even up you know, with us owning this project and um, in what, you know, seemed like a risky deal 40, 45 days ago now seems like, you know, a really safe deal. And then just a month later, the business is shut down. There's no rent and we can't pay our mortgage. And it's just crazy how fast that happened. And now it seems like the stupidest time ever to buy a restaurant. But we didn't know, um, clearly didn't know what this would happen. And irregardless, um, you know, is, you know, irregardless is planning to come back stronger than ever. Lee's going to use this opportunity to do some facelift things that, you know, probably would have not happened for a few years now. But we're going to do that, get the building cleaned up and be ready to roll when this is over. And then um, Crash, to adjust your question on ownership, it's completely different ownership in terms of the operating entity. Lee Robinson owns the operating entity at irregardless while another group of us and the trophy brewing thing, brewing business, but we're all friends and we all work together and we're all trying to get through this pandemic together too. Thank you for answering that. Um, another question from Juice Sprague. What's an element of the new normal with COVID-19 that we will be surprised about or an element that may take a little longer to get used to? Um, I think the one that's going to take longer to get used to is the mask. Um, you know, I do think the new normal is masks in public places for a while um, until we figure out, you know, you know, until we know more about how and where it's spreading. Um, and that means servers at coffee shops, for example, or restaurants wearing masks. It means a lot of customers wearing masks. Um, and, and that sort of that's, I think, a hard thing for a lot of people to get used to because you're so used to seeing people's faces and, um, it, you know, it makes you feel like you're scared, but there is something out there for us to be worried about. So I think that's a new normal for me. Um, in terms of, um, you know, what's and that's going to stay long term, I think the to go business is going to be something that is going to stay long term. Um, and businesses, you know, the sooner we can adapt and pivot to that, um, the better for the businesses. But um, I think we, um, people are going to do to go way more often than they did before. And even higher end restaurants, um, you know, are going to have to to pivot to that and have some revenue from that long term. So. Thank you for that. Sean Gleason had a um, question. Davis has always supported the Healing Place 
does he have a close personal experience with people recovering from drugs and alcohol? And what drives that passion to support? So I love healing transitions. Um, so the way we got involved there was um, healing transitions is on Dix Park and it's a detox and recovery center that's free. We have one of the best detox recovery centers in the country here in downtown Raleigh and anybody can walk in any day and get service, no cost. Um, it's just an amazing facility. So before, um, before Trophy Brewing moved into Healing Transitions neighborhood over on Maywood Avenue, um, the neighborhood hadn't always been positive on Healing Transitions um, because of the foot traffic and whatever. And, um, and we sort of said, no, that's not how we're gonna look at it. The best neighborhoods have a brewery, high-end housing, low-end housing, a homeless shelter like Healing Transitions has, a park with Dick's Park, um, and a greenway system, which is right there, and two, two seafood spots, <laughs> which we have. But those are the best neighborhoods, ones that have a, um, a diverse group of folks living and working there. And so we chose to embrace Healing Transitions, um, and, and sort of that's how we got involved. And then the relationship has just grown from there. Once you see um, some of the stories that come out of there, folks' lives who's been have been turned around, um, and you know that's 99% of why it's so important. But then you start to look at the amount of money a place like Healing Transitions saves our city and county. Um, it's just crazy in terms of police calls and EMS calls, and um, and it's really you know the most bang for its buck in terms of. Um, you know, causes to be involved with and support. So, um, so that's where the passion comes from. You know, I, you know, we love being neighbors with them and, and, and they've been really supportive of us too. And, and so, um, and, and now of course, being involved there, I do know people who've been through there and had some success um, with the program too. So. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question from Christopher Massey. Is Trophy considering joining the All Together Initiative? How can small breweries around the country further collaborate to help local communities come together and provide resources? So I don't know about the All Together Initiative, but just by the name, it sounds pretty good. And we've been really open to joining you know, a lot of these campaigns. Um, one thing that happened right away after this was we were so paralyzed from what had happened to our um, business overnight, basically. Um, and people were coming at us with all types of ideas that it was hard, hard to filter them all. And, and honestly, just hard to answer all the emails. And, but now, you know, five weeks in, we've gotten to a better place where um, we can um, work on projects and, and start to help. And I think the, the bottom line answer is yes, we are, um, thinking about getting involved with all types of ways to help our local community and and whatever we can do to help, you know, we're going to be on the team. Great. I have two questions from um, Home Esharadi, and please forgive me if I mispronounced your name. Have you considered a shift to e-commerce to have a more direct to consumer business model? And would you say an early stage beverage, beverage company should start adopting that? Yes. So two thoughts on that. One, um, we pivoted really quickly to have an online ordering service. Um, so the reason for that was people were still coming to our business to order to go in person. And there's some um, worry that the virus could spread in that type of interaction. So we created this online thing. And if you haven't done that with your business, you should. Even if you're not in the restaurant business, service business, whatever, now's a great opportunity to shift. And I think you'll notice that your orders increase just because there's a certain number of folks who like to do that. Um, and then um, and then we also, on that same vein, we got really good at the no contact um, or tried to stay in front of it, of the no contact mask gloves. Um, you know, anything you can do to protect your employees and your customers is a good thing and will give people more assurance that your location is a safe spot. And certainly that makes sense in our business, in the restaurant business, but it really makes sense in any business. Even if you're a law firm, you know, you need to be thinking about, you know, what's going to make your employees feel safe coming in. 
Um, and, you know, where do you need to have hand, hand sanitizer? What kind of spacing do you need to require in the break room? How do you alternate days when people come in? Everybody needs to be thinking about how to adjust. And then in terms of the online platform um, in, in shipping, yes, we have moved to Tropy is now delivering beer within the Raleigh area and shipping beer um, across the country and some places. And it's been surprising at how much that's been. Um, is it going to keep the business afloat? No, but it's an extra 5%, which really helps right now. And a lot of the orders have been from folks who used to live in Raleigh, like Trophy Beer when they when they um, lived here and now live somewhere else. And during this pandemic, when people are drinking from home, they want a, a taste of Raleigh. So we've been doing that. But I, I do feel like every business should figure out how to function better online, um, not only as a requirement now, but I think you'll see a boost um, after this is done. Thank you for that. We have another question from Jennifer Martin. This Saturday is virtual Brugaloo, where consumers are buying beer and the money goes back to breweries. What do events like this mean to your brewery in particular? Well, Brugaloo has always been a wonderful event for craft breweries in North Carolina and, and Trophy too. And I think the, you know, certainly the, the proceeds will be helpful for our team um and and you know keep us over the hump but the biggest thing is like we have um you know events like that in groups um like jennifer's in our corner and we know that and it's just so comforting to know that so many people care about us and so many people are rooting for us to come out of this alive um and and that's what's helpful and um so it really means the world i'm so glad to hear virtual burgaloo is going to happen. I was a little worried about it. We have our virtual cheers beer coming out on Friday, just in time for that. Um, but Brugaloo has always um, been a great fundraiser um, for the small business community and um, and this year, no exception. Awesome. We have one last question through the chat before we transition over to the raise your hand feature. Um, this question comes from John Heisman. Please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. I know you are a big component of mass transit. Yay. What are your thoughts on how this new push for social social distancing will impact the use of things like buses, which are which are a critical component of a good mass transit strategy? Yeah, so I'm a huge proponent of mass transit. And then before this happened, I was lobbying for fare free bus system in Raleigh. The thinking was that most of the people who are riding the bus are lowest income workers. So why are we charging them a couple bucks each day just to get to and from work? I do think the bus system in, um, in subway systems in bigger cities um, will look different for a long time. We'll have to distance um, as much as we can and the ridership will be down because some percentage of folks will avoid it if they can. And currently, I think smartly, the city is saying, don't ride the bus unless you have to, to get to work. Um, so I think, you know, unfortunately, short term, it means less people will ride. I don't think long term, it, it, it should have a negative impact. Uh, at least I hope it doesn't. Mass transit is the solution for, you know, us moving to a green world, um, you know, in terms of, you know, less trips and less congestion and, um, and just more efficient financial use. Um, one opportunity here with the bus system is less people are riding. And so um, it almost was more expensive um, to collect the fare than the fare was generated. So the city um, during this moved to fare free buses. Um, it's a short term move but it allows us to sort of see how that works and, and stops the spread of germs on money. Um, and it was a really, you know, nice shift by the city and we can sort of test that, that move out. And a silver lining out of this may be um, sort of, you know, hey, we've, we've realized fair free is a good idea and we can move to that long-term. But short-term, I think you can look at cities in China as an example, um, and it's not the way Folks like me hope it goes, but you know, car sales are up. People are less likely to get on a bus and instead are sort of getting in their personal vehicles. 
Um, and it's sort of not the direction we wanted to go from a green standpoint, but um, until the virus stops spreading, um, I think it's at least, you know, understandable. Thank you for that. Thank you for asking those questions. We're going to now take a few live questions. If anyone has a question for David, please signify by raising your hand and we'll call on you momentarily if anyone has a question. Does anyone have anything? Well, our online audience is quiet at the moment. David, thank you so much. We're gonna now turn things back over to Travis to ask a question, well, to give us closing remarks and thank you so much. Thanks, Des. Thank you. David, thank you for uh, for sharing your journey today. It's uh, it was a it was a great a great story, and I'm sure it was very inspiring. It was inspiring to me, and I'm sure it was inspiring to the to the attendees today. I I, I jotted a couple things down that you said is you know optimism and, and persistence will will rule the world and will change the world. And you know I think about that a lot. Um, you know, live it, you know, try to live your life as a glass half full. You know, you wake up every day and you do the right thing, like what you said, and you, you live by that. And, you know, that is, um, you don't give up on you, on your values. Um, because, you know, that's really who, what defines us. And so I, I thank you for sharing that. And that meant something to me. And I, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you said today. So thank you for your time. And, and uh, and please uh, visit the uh, chamber uh, website for future events. Thank you. Thanks, Travis.